Uh, our speaker is, uh, well, you know, gosh, I really, really like Paul Angoni. Uh, you know, I, once in a while I get to hang out with a student long enough uh, in college and then beyond college where I just look back and I say, hey, this guy's my friend, and, and Paul is one of those guys. Paul was in the first class that kind of got all the way through Westmont, and they had me as a campus pastor. Paul has uh, done some wonderful things. He graduated from Westmont in 05 with a degree in communication studies. He went on to Azusa Pacific University to get a degree in organizational leadership. Uh, he has written uh, a wickedly funny and wise book about what it means to be in your 20s. Uh, when I read it, the, the manuscript, I, I just don't do this often, but I, I just laughed out loud. And, uh, but I laughed in, in, in the way you laugh when you say, man, that's so true, that is so true. And uh, this is just a great book. And so I'm just eager to have you here, Paul, in just a moment. Uh, he's married to Naomi, has two beautifully cute and wonderful daughters living in San Diego. And Paul, uh, we welcome you to Westmont, back to Westmont. Uh, but before Paul comes up, there is a video that uh, you need to see, and then Paul will come up and speak to us. What do you want to do when you grow up? Right? That's the question we get asked when we're little kids and we have our answers. We're going to be a figure skater. Uh, maybe we're going to be a prehistoric artist <laughs> and never get married and live in our parents' house after they die. Uh, <laughs> You know, we all have that idea, that plan, that, uh, you know, that kind of one word answer. And maybe that changes. You know, when we get into college, maybe we get more serious. We realize we can't say, I want to be a figure skater anymore. Uh, I, I want to be a baseball player. So we change our answer. Maybe I'm going to be a doctor. You know, somebody, your professor asks, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? Oh, I'm going to be an accountant. We all have our answer. And when I was here, when I was at college, I definitely had my answer. But I'll admit to you something right now that I stand before you uh, just a complete failure at it. At least that's how I felt most of my 20s. I felt like I was a complete failure. You know, because I was going to leave this place and I was going to go make a difference. I was going to go change the world. And if I, if, if I didn't make a difference, at least I was going to leave this place and hopefully make a lot of money. Right? And if I didn't make a lot of money, at least hopefully I would do a job I enjoyed. And if it wasn't a job I enjoyed, maybe at least it was a job that had a cool title that I could put on Facebook and brag to all my friends that I had a really cool job, even if it was nothing like that. But when I left this place with all these hopes and dreams and this idea of this is what I'm going to do now, I'm a grown-up now, I'm a graduate, the only job interview I could get was for used airplane parts sales assistant. Used airplane parts sales assistant. That has dream job written all over it, right? That's probably what a lot of you say, you know, when they say, what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to sell used airplane parts. So I went into that first interview, right? I was really nervous because it's your first real interview. So I had my tie, you know, I had my, my iron pants, and I just figured out how to, how to iron like a week before. So I'm sure they didn't look that great. You know, I was very nervous, and mainly I was nervous because this was the first time I realized that you can fly on planes that are using used airplane parts. <laughs> right? Doesn't that seem just wrong? I want the plane's wings that are taking me 20,000 miles in the air to be brand spanking new. I don't want any used airplane parts. But anyway, I go to this interview, and, and I'm going through the process. I'm smiling, I'm nodding, I'm shaking hands, and there's a theme that, that comes up with every person I interview, interview with there. They're all like this. This is about how they go. Yeah, you know, um, this is a really exciting opportunity. Uh, great, great upward mobility. Uh, I, just, I just love, I love working here. I'm like, does, are we being gassed? Is there gas coming in right now? Are you being poisoned? Like, everybody is just miserable here. And I think I would become an alcoholic if I worked here. Let's just be honest. Let's just be real with each other. I can't do this. I remember just freaking out, just like, this is what I prepared for? This is what I spent, you know, 150,000 million trillion dollars at Westmont to go do? <laughs> right? So I'm going to quickly just talk about some secrets for how to do college right, how to prepare, and how to launch well in your 20s, because I did not do that well. 
right? Because our whole lives, we're climbing the stairwell. You're just doing one step after another. You go from middle school to high school, pick the right college, pick the right major, make sure you show up on time, get the right grades, maybe go to grad school. We keep climbing those stairs, right? Because up there somewhere is success. Up there somewhere is the answer. Up there somewhere is going to be your spouse and your job and your dream and your life. It's up there somewhere, right? Just keep climbing. Keep climbing those steps. You're going to get there. And when I got to the top, this is what I envisioned. You know, I was going to be at Google working at the cool job. It's so cool it doesn't even feel like work, right? We're just like playing foosball all day and coming up with cool ideas and laughing all the time about nothing because we're just so excited to work there. That's kind of what I envisioned my life to be like after college. But instead, I climbed all those steps, I opened the door, and this is what I felt like I saw. <laughs> I felt like somehow they had tricked me, and I had somehow ended up back into like the basement, which looks something like, like a Stephen King novel, you know? And I started going through all the halls, and, and the doors were locked, and it was dimly lit, and there was like one guy at the end with like the lone light bulb over his head, and he's just kind of laughing at me, and I'm like, why are you laughing at me? I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. And he just keeps laughing. He doesn't even give you any answers. One of those freaky old guys, <laughs> you know? It just felt like nothing like I expected. So at that point, I became very passionate about, okay, how do I do this right? How do you do your 20s really right? How do you leave college and do it well? What are some of the secrets? So for the last decade, this is what I've been pouring my life into and pursuing. So we'll get right to it. We'll start with secret number one. Say no to your OCD. And I'm not talking about OCD as we usually think about. But I would say this is the smallpox of our generation. This is plaguing us, and it'll strip creativity, it'll strip your, uh, your energy, it'll make you depressed. It is a huge issue that I see, that I knew I was doing, and I see a lot of 20-somethings going through. And it's obsessive comparison disorder. Right? We do it all the time. This place is like a petri dish of obsessive comparison disorder. And you're being judged by it, right? You're always, you, you, you go to class and you, you want to be the best. And hey, what did you get on that test? You know, and you're always judging yourselves on that. And then you jump on Facebook and you look at everybody's pictures and oh, did they do a cooler thing this weekend than I did? And this only gets worse when you get into your 20s. As you start branching out and you start leaving this place, you start keeping dibs on people. And I remember feeling so depressed when I would see everybody's amazing lives on Facebook when my life felt anything but amazing. And it took me a long time to realize that everybody is putting a PR spin on their own Facebook profile. Everybody's putting a PR spin on their own Instagram feed, and it's not reality. And there was a lot of people struggling just as badly as I was, but we weren't talking about it. Because we were all comparing ourselves. And it, it took me a long time to realize, you know, if I keep trying to live other people's lives, who's going to live mine? If I keep trying to live other people's lives, who is going to live my life? If my worth is based on what I think other people are doing, if my worth is based on other people's worth, then I'm going to be worthless because my worth is not coming from anywhere substantial. And I was on this epic search for supposed to. You know, when am I going to be successful like I'm supposed to? When am I going to have, you know, a wife like I was supposed to, a career like I was supposed to, money like I was supposed to, a house like I was supposed to? When am I going to have all those things? And then I realized just a simple, true, profound statement that life will never feel like it's supposed to. Your life is going to feel and look very different than you envision it right now. Because a lot of times our supposed to is built on all these expectations that aren't necessarily um, going to come to pass. And I'm not saying don't have big plans, don't have big dreams, don't want to make a difference, you know, do all those things. Our plans aren't the problem. 
Our timeline is the problem. Our plans are not the problem. Our timeline is the problem. Because if you feel like there's a big purpose building inside of you, if you feel like God has spoken a lot of promises in your life, the bigger the promise, the bigger the preparation. The bigger the promise that you feel is on your life, the purpose, what you want to go do, the harder the preparation is going to be. And by preparation, I mean like you're trying to lift a 250-pound weight and it just is just ripping your muscles. It just is so intense. That's what it can feel like. You know, it'd be like me right now saying, hey, I'm going to go run uh, an Olympic marathon. I'm going to be an Olymp- Olympic marathoner. You know, I'm 5'10", I'm Italian. Italians don't really run marathons. You know, and it'd be like, okay, I'm going to go do that and I'm going to go do that tomorrow. I'm going to go do that tomorrow. I'm going to be an Olympic marathon runner tomorrow. Right? Of course, that'd be stupid. You know, you wouldn't do that. But that's the same kind of way. We, you know, we want to leave college and we want to enter right into that marathon, right into that place where we are running our race. But this is just that starting point into your real preparation of, of now you're really preparing and you're building those muscles so that you can do that. And just remember, the grass is always greener on the other side until you get there and you realize it's because of all the manure. <laughs> Everybody's got their own manure that they're working with, right? And that manure helps fertilize things and makes things grow. But everybody's got it and it smells just as much as the stuff you're dealing with. Sorry to be graphic. <laughs> but just remember that when you start comparing yourself to your friends and you feel like, man, you know, Jim's doing this or Jane's doing that. Remember, they have their own stuff they're dealing with. Everybody's got it. So let's go on to secret two. And secret two, I would just define as, as fail. There is an epidemic of success in college. An epidemic of success in college, right? And you are all very successful people. To be sitting in a seat right now, you are very successful. You have done a lot of things right to get here. I was the same way. You know, I had good grades. I had the leadership. I had the sports. I had, you know, had all those things that I could put on my checklist. But I realized a lot of my self-worth and my identity was built around success. So then when I left Westmont and I didn't feel like I was having much success, well, gosh, where do you think my identity went and my self-worth? It took me a long time to realize that the biggest failure of our 20s would be if we never had any. <coughs> that the biggest failure would be if we never had any. So many people, so many stories, you know, you've heard them all, whether it's Abraham Lincoln, who ran for office time and time again and kept getting defeated, who proposed to a woman and got turned down, who basically spent his whole 20s in complete failure, which helped build up the strength and the perseverance to go do what he needed to do. Maybe it was David from the Bible. You know, he, he gets told he's going to be the king. You know, how would you like that right now? We all want that, right? Where that kind of person comes up to you and just that prophet and says, here's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And you're like, sweet, the answer, you know? But then he gets told he's going to be king and then he spends years being out in the caves as a, a convict being chased for his life. You know, Moses was, was told he was going to go lead the people out of Egypt, but then he gets thrown out and goes spend 40 years in the desert preparing to then spend another 40 years in the desert to lead his people out of Egypt. But if these biblical examples aren't more you know, profound, let's do a more profound example. Oh, the song always gets to me, sorry. You guys have heard that song before? Maybe like once or twice or like 2,000 trillion times, right? That was like the anthem last year. 
But his story is really intriguing to me, and there's so many stories like it, but that Nate Russ is the lead singer, and I don't know if you know the story of Fun, that's the group who, who did this song, but uh, he got signed to a major label when he was 19, and he had another group called The Format, and he was pretty successful, right? Some people probably liked The Format, but do you know what happened? He got dropped by his label, which was a huge failure. His band broke up. There was no more format. He had so much failure, and I've read interviews by him just saying he was ready to quit. He was just ready to give up. By his late 20s, it was just over. But he starts this other group called Fun. They start creating some songs. He tries to meet with a producer that blows him off a couple times. Then he sings the chorus of that song to this producer in a hotel room, and the producer's like, that's it. I gotta do that song with you guys. You know, and, and they win and this is what I just think is crazy. He wins Best New Artist of the Year in 2013. Do you get the irony of that? He wins Best New Artist of the Year when he's like 32. And he got signed to a major label when he was 19. But nobody really cared about the backstory. All of a sudden, he was new. You know? And I'm sure he just laughs and thinks, well, I was doing this for about 13 years and no one cared one little bit until this hit song came about, Right? And that's really true for most of us. We all want to find our passion. That is the, that's the question, right? What am I passionate about? We all want to find it. I spent so many years searching for what is my passion. How do you find your passion? And I, I've come up with one thing, one true secret that I think is the key to finding your passion. Your passion can only be found in failure that you've refused to let fail. Your passion is only found in those things that completely go wrong. You get dropped by your label. You get sent into the desert. You're so far from that promise that you felt God was speaking to you. You're wondering if God is crazy and you're crazy. But you know what? You keep doing it. You keep showing up and you keep writing. You keep showing up and you keep singing. You keep showing up and you keep studying. You keep doing that one thing because it's like, I don't care how many people tell me no. I don't care how many dead ends I hit. I don't care if my plans feel like there's been a hand grenade shoved in a hot pocket and somebody pulled the pin and just blew up my plans, right? Just, you know? That's my hot pocket impersonation. I don't do that very often, only on special occasions, but... Uh, you know, what's that one thing that you just keep doing no matter what? Failure is that secret sauce to clarify a lot of things in your life. So don't shy away from it. Because the possibility for greatness and embarrassment both exist in the same space. If you're not willing to be embarrassed, you're probably not willing to be great. Just take that to the bank. Hold on to that one. Nobody wants to be embarrassed. I don't want to be embarrassed. But if you're going to do anything great, the possibility for greatness and embarrassment both have to exist there. They both have to live there. You can't do great things if you're worried about, well, how am I going to look? What are people going to say? It doesn't work that way. So right now, make yourself uncomfortable. Comfort is a quicksand that you can't escape from. And this can be a very comfortable place. Try to make yourself uncomfortable. And what I mean by that is trying things that are out of your comfort zone. Trying things that are difficult for you. Trying things that you know you should without any really guarantee that you're going to succeed at them. Because failure is simply finding a more profound way to be successful. Failure is simply finding a more profound way to be successful if you're willing to keep at it and learn from it. And secret three is just real quick, start building your brand right now. And what I mean by brand, and I'll just do this real quick, and this is a whole workshop, a whole seminar we could do on this, but basically this is branding, right? You don't go home and say, oh man, I just can't wait to crack open a Shasta. <laughs> right? Coke has obviously done well with a lot of branding. But branding, when you think of your own personal brand, you guys all have a brand right now that you're creating. You all have one. Whether you think you have a brand or not, that's what it is. When people think about you, what do you want them to think? It's 
basically who you are. What do people say about you? Are you the person that falls asleep in class? Are you the person that's in the front row? Are you the person that's uh, getting good grades? Whatever it might be, what do people think about you? Start working on that right now because that is the key when you leave this place. This is your network and a lot of your jobs and opportunities are gonna come from your brand that you're building right now. So be intentional about that, think through that. And this is the last secret. I was so focused on getting my dream job. So much of my identity was wrapped around that idea of I need to find my dream job. Like I said, I felt like such a failure. I didn't realize that crappy jobs are kind of this 20-something rite of passage, right? That some of you might have to sell insurance after college. Some of you might have to work in a cubicle that you don't really like. You might be working at Starbucks still. You might be unemployed, living at your parents' house, back in your old room with like the dinosaur bedspread that's still there. <laughs> you know, wondering like, wow, oh, God, this is, this is it. But I was so concerned about being in the wrong job. What I needed to be concerned about and worried about was my job getting the right me. Don't worry so much about your dream job. Don't worry about getting the right job. Worry about your job getting the right you. That's what you should be focused on because that's what's going to lead to better opportunities. And you can do that right now, whether it's an internship, whether you're a tour guide, wh whatever you're doing, show up and do your best work right now because that's what's going to lead to those opportunities. And I learned this watching a Starbucks barista who was doing this amazing job and everybody loved him and they were all asking him questions and he was just like this most loved person that I've ever seen at Starbucks. Um, and I started creating this guy's story when I'm sitting there. I'm watching this guy. I'm like, why is this guy so happy? Why is he so into this? And I start creating this guy's story. I'm like, well, maybe he was you know, maybe, because he's like 30-something, and I'm like, maybe he was uh, fired from his job, and he's just really thankful to be at Starbucks. And maybe he actually lives with his parents, but he just shows up and has such a great attitude. And I see this guy limping a little bit, and I'm like, this guy has one leg, too. <laughs> this guy has like one leg, right? And he shows up, and he's, he's like the mayor of Starbucks, but he's the one-legged mayor of Starbucks. But, you know, he's like this Hallmark character, and people love him. But then, you know, I, I realized, and I kind of lied to you guys, that that, guy, that guy's my brother, and I've never seen him working at Starbucks before, and what I just said is exactly true. He has one leg. He lost his job. He was living back in my parents' basement at age 33, and he was working at Starbucks. And he would get up at 4 a.m., and he'd go to Starbucks, and he felt miserable. But then I saw him working for the first time and I was so convicted because he was doing such an amazing job. And he told me, he said, Paul, I, I, I made a decision early on. I was going to show up and do my best every single day, no matter the circumstances. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how convicting is that? Because rocking your 20s and rocking life after college is, is sometimes nothing more glamorous than patient everydayness. It's every day showing up and doing good work, and it's not sexy, and it's not something anybody's gonna write a song about, but that's, that's what tr uh, true success is. So if you guys feel like you're lost when you leave, you know, that's okay, because being lost and exploring is a pretty similar thing, right? All explorers had to get lost, right? They had to all go somewhere and do something where they didn't really know exactly where they were going. But the difference is they were willing to get lost on purpose with purpose. So they just weren't wandering around aimlessly. They knew kind of an idea where they were going. They had the plan. They had the maps. They had the guides. But they were okay getting lost on purpose with purpose. So if you feel right now that you don't have a lot of clarity, if you feel like when you leave this place that you feel lost, it's okay. Give yourself grace to be willing to get lost on purpose with purpose. And that's when you're going to find that destination. Thank you guys for having me.